Good morning. My name is Michael Keane, producer and director of many historical documentaries, some of whom you might have seen. The story of Hart Island, Abandon, Madhouse, and Question of Sanity. Today, I would like to introduce you to my latest work, The Strange Disappearance of Captain William Morgan. William Morgan was originally from Virginia, but in 1826 moved to Batavia, New York. And while visiting with some associates in Canandaigua, he was arrested for having been accused of stealing a shirt and a tie, uh, which came to the grand total of $2.60, and subsequently was put into the Canandaigua jailhouse. One night, according to the jailer's wife, who observed this from the second floor of the jail, three men arrived, paid Morgan's fine, and took him from the jailhouse, put him into a waiting carriage, and whisked him away. That would be the last that anyone would ever see or hear from William Morgan. The belief was that those three men were from a local Masonic lodge and had kidnapped Morgan, taken to Fort Niagara near Buffalo, and drowned in order to prevent him from publishing a book that would reveal the inner secrets of the Masonic order. This kidnapping and apparent murder has existed for the last 200 years and has proven to be one of the great conspiracy theories of all time. But according to a document that I was able to locate that had been kept locked in a safe inside of a locked closet, inside of a locked hallway, inside of a locked room, inside of a locked building, would be a different theory on what happened to William Morgan by someone who claims to have been involved in this whole affair. Well, before I tell you the ending, it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to the strange disappearance of Captain William Morgan. Hey, you guys. I hate to be a party pooper, but it's snowing like the devil outside, and I think I'm going to close early. Oh, come on, Rose. What's your hurry? It's not like we haven't seen snow before. Besides, Andy and I were thinking of having a bowl of soup. Uh, you two have been nursing those beers for half an hour now. Besides, the kitchen is closed. Oh, I didn't see you come in. Have to warn you that we're planning on closing early, but you're welcome to a quick one. Should be able to win. Yeah, I think look good. Thank you. Give me a shot of your top shelf whiskey. And while you're at it, buy these fellas one too. I don't think I've ever seen you before. Are you from Lima? Oh, I used to pass this way before. In fact, I spent a few nights here after having too many of these. Mmm. Oh, boy, that hits the spot. I think I'll have another. In fact, 
fact, I could tell you a thing or two about this place that might surprise you. Oh, is that so? Well, my family have owned this place since 1920, and I've worked here for over 30 years, so I don't think much has happened that I don't know about already. Tell you what, the weather the way it is, and the whiskey as good as it is, I have a half a mind to tell you my tale. Well, as I was saying before, I'm planning on closing early because of the storm. But if you can tell me a story about the American Hotel that I haven't heard before, well, I guess I'm willing to listen. Fair enough. Pour me another. Another for these fellows. Let's see. The best place to begin is at the beginning. Aye. In the early 19th century, a peculiar series of events occurred in a small town with a group of men called the Freemasons. There was deception with possible abduction and murder. No one now alive knows exactly what happened. Some of the details were never recorded. Others were recorded all too well. This was not the first time in history the Freemasons were accused of conspiracy, nor it was the only time they were suspected of killing to protect their order. Rumor had it that they killed Amadeus Mozart for revealing Masonic secrets in his opera, The Magic Flute. And some say that London's Whitechapel murders were a Masonic scheme to protect the British monarchy from scandal. But the case of William Morgan is the most notorious of these episodes and the one I'm about to tell. was away that night when three men showed up at the jail insisting I release Mr. Morgan into their custody. I told them that before I could do so his debt had to be paid. At first they were very angry and stormed out. About half an hour later they returned and agreed to pay his fine out of their own pockets. So, what was I to do? I then agreed to release Mr. Morgan, who at that time was quite drunk and who appeared to go willingly. The next thing I heard was someone crying for help. When I looked out the window, I saw Mr. Morgan being put into a waiting coach pulled by two grey mares. Oh, it was a terrible sight, I tell you. One that I won't soon forget. This storm is playing havoc with our power. You better hurry up with your story. The basic facts are these. There was a fellow by the name of William Morgan who vanished one night without a trace. In the night, he was never seen again. His disappearance began with a series of inconsequential events in a small town. And when it ended, it became a movement that reached national proportions. But wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. Go on. Let's really start at the beginning, some 3,000 years ago. According to Masonic lore, Hiram Abiff was the chief architect of the temple, built by King Solomon in 1050 BC. Hiram Abiff was not only the architect of the temple, but he was also charged by Solomon 
to be the only person on earth who knew the secrets of a master mason, including the most important secret of all, the grand Masonic word, the name of God. Hiram Abiff had been approached many times during the construction of the temple to reveal the secret, but he vowed not to do so until his work was completed. One day, upon leaving the temple, Abiff was approached by the three ruffians, who demanded that they be given the secret immediately. When Hiram refused, he was murdered, and his body hastily concealed in a quarry near the temple. When Hiram was noticed to be missing, Solomon ordered a search where Hiram's body was soon discovered. After repeated attempts were made to lift his body from the pit where he was placed, Solomon lifted him out and restored him to life. Hiram's first word was the grand Masonic word that was lost at his death. And that word is the one word that is passed down to Master Masons to this day. When I was 16, I married William Morgan. We were both from Culpeper County, Virginia, where my father was a Presbyterian minister when I married William, he had told me he had become a captain during the War of 1812 and had served with General Andrew Jackson. At the time we married, William was working odd jobs, and for a while we were able to manage, but when the children started arriving, William decided we should move to Toronto. When we first got to Canada, William found work on a farm, but then a job opened up in a brewery which paid more. A couple of months later, the brewery burned down for suspicious reasons, they said. We then moved to Rochester, where William became a bricklayer. Later that year, William was promised a job working on the Knights Templar building in Leroy, so we moved again. For a while, things were going well, but William started drinking very hard, and he was borrowing money to pay our bills, which we couldn't always repay. This made people very angry. William then fell in with a Masonic lodge in Batavia, and it looked like things would improve. But then the real problems began. After William began to attend meetings at the Lodge, he formally applied for membership to become a Royal Arch Mason. But he was rejected for drunkenness, they said. Now a lot of the boys like their drink, but I'm afraid that William would drink too much and sometimes for days at a time. When he learned he had been turned down, he became furious and vowed revenge. That's when the Morgan story began to take its turn. That eventually led to his disappearance and to the sad little story about the American Hotel. Hurry now. David C. Miller, the publisher of the Batavian newspaper, The Advocate, soon began to become aware of Morgan's intent to publish a book that would reveal the Masonic secrets. Miller, like Morgan, had been recently expelled from the Batavia Lodge for reasons of poor conduct and drunkenness and had heard of Morgan's boasting of his plan while openly drinking in the local Batavia taverns, harboring great resentment towards the Masons to say nothing about his belief that Morgan's book could become a bestseller and make him a rich man, Miller agreed to become Morgan's partner and publish his expose. When word got out about the scheme, the die was cast. When the Grand Masonic Lodge in Rochester 
heard about the proposed book, they hired a Canadian fur trader named Daniel Johns to infiltrate Miller's and Morgan's plot. When Johns confirmed that the book was about to be published, events quickly began to spin out of control. While it was true, as Mary Hall and others had testified, that the Masons had taken Morgan away that night, murder could not be proven, as no body was found. But all that changed one year later. My husband Timothy had gone fishing in the fall of 27 and had not come home. We thought he might have drowned during a storm. When I heard that a body had come ashore at Oak Orchard, I thought it could have been him, so I went to see for myself. The body was in very poor condition and was putrid. I couldn't say if it was my Timothy or not, although the body had teeth just like his. They were double, all around. The coroner then provided me with the clothes that were found on the body, which I identified right away as belonging to my husband. What decided it for me was that a few weeks before he left, I had donned a pair of socks for him. I had to use a different color thread, as I was out to the usual kind. One of the socks had that same color that I had used. It was red. Immediately after the body at Orchard Park was discovered, Lucinda Morgan went to see if she could identify it. But, due to its badly deteriorated condition, she was unable to swear that it was her husband, except for one very curious and unique physical characteristic, William Morgan, like Timothy Monroe, had a double row of teeth all around. Two weeks after Lucinda and Mrs. Monroe had viewed the body, Lucinda returned with a local Rochester publisher and politician by the name of Thurlow Weed. Weed had for months railed against the Masons in his editorials and had even accused them of murder. Now, with weed in tow, Lucinda viewed the body for a second time and miraculously identified it as her husband. Incredibly, in front of over 40 witnesses who were present at the inquest, the body now changed. Now, showing a shaved head where hair once grew, and sporting facial hair where it had once been clean-shaven, the Masons accused Weed of somehow commandeering the body in order to alter the appearance. When asked after the investigation if he thought the body was really Morgan's, Weed was reported to have said, it's a good enough Morgan for now. In the end, it was officially determined that the body was in fact the poor Timothy Monroe after all. But some claim, even to this day, the body that floated ashore that fall was none other than Captain William Morgan. Now that's quite a story. And to think most of it happened near here. But what I don't understand what does all of this have to do with the American Hotel? Well, let me tell you what very few people know about the American Hotel and the strange disappearance of Captain William Morgan. When William Morgan disappeared, anti-masonry fervor gripped the country. Before his disappearance, there were over 480 Masonic lodges in New York State alone. Within 15 years, their numbers had dwindled to under 40. 
Even the Grand Lodge of Rochester shuttered its doors for the next 20 years. The Morgan affair even had national ramifications as the 1828 presidential election saw the anti-Masons form the first third party in the nation, collecting over 250,000 votes. It was during those terrible and dark days that Lima became the only surviving lodge in all of Livingston County. Meeting secretly on the third floor of the American Hotel, it was on a very cold and wintry night during one of the meetings that someone had stolen the Masons' overcoats. At the time, it was thought that just a common thief had been involved. Exactly one month later, during another meeting, a pile of previously stolen clothes were now neatly piled against the lodge room door with a note attached. The note explained that the clothes had been found by a local Lima citizen who now wanted them returned to their rightful owners. Unbeknownst to the Masons, though, was that the clothes had been intentionally infected with smallpox. And as a result, all of the Masons in that room that night, save one, came down with that dreaded contagion. Three years after William Morgan's disappearance, Lucinda married George Harris, a local Batavia silversmith and jeweler. Shortly thereafter, she and Harris moved to Indiana, where they became disciples of Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon Church. After an affair that lasted for several years, Lucinda Pendleton Morgan Harris became Joseph Smith's third plural wife. In 1844, while being held on charges of treason by the state of Illinois, Smith, along with his brother Hiram, was shot to death by a gang of vigilantes. Soon after Smith's death, Lucinda and Harris divorced. Lucinda eventually converted to Catholicism, became a nun, and joined the Sisters of Charity. When last seen, she was reported to have been tending to wounded Union troops at the Battle of Shiloh. It is not known how or where she died. Where the hell did he go? Oh, was just here. And what's worse, he left without paying his bill. Now, what do you make of this? In 1881, while excavating a quarry 15 miles from William Morgan's Batavia home, a workman unearthed a skeleton covered by a pile of dirt and a large stone. Nearby lay a tobacco box containing a piece of paper and a silver ring. Written on the paper were the words, Liar, Mason murder. Inscribed on the ring were the initials W. M. Upon examining the skull, a curious and unique characteristic was found. It contained 
a double row of teeth all around. The day after the skeleton was found in the quarry, Dr. Elmer A. Phillips, a local Batavia physician, was called upon to conduct an examination. Dr. Phillips reported that the remains appeared to be those of a middle-aged man who had likely been dead for many years. Dr. Phillips went on to conclude that due to the body's advanced state of decay, it was not possible to determine the exact manner of death but that, in his opinion, the man had most likely died of natural causes. <laughs> like any other hysteria, this also passed. Passions wore themselves away. A few sturdy and brave men stood staunchly by a few grand lodges with high courage, and they never ceased to proclaim their allegiance to the order. Little by little, Freemasonry raised its head. One by one, lodges took heart. Brother by brother, craftsmen returned to the altars. Dreadful as it was to the men who lived through it, terrible in its consequences to the brethren who suffered, it demonstrated again and again, it may be hoped and believed, once and for all, that the underlying faith of Freemasonry, its ancient landmarks, its foundations upon Diet and the Great Light, together and stronger than any evil, more lasting than any calumny, more enduring than any human passions. Forever and forever, so mote it be. There's been times in my life when I felt so all alone and I had no one to call my own. That's when you. Thank you. 